I see that some of us uh, survived uh, the weekend. This wants to be very elementary today, and everybody should understand, and uh, please interrupt me if there is a problem. I mean it. So I want to do a little introduction to toric geometry. And, um, but I want to start uh, from an unusual end, namely from this definition, uh, that a, tor a toric variety is a geometric quotient, whatever is a quotient, well, I'm just say a quotient. CM modular torus, where the torus acts on CM via a representation C to C star the M. So There are various references for this, but perhaps the most complete and self-contained is uh, in the book, Cox, Little, and uh, Schenck. Uh, toric varieties. Okay. And the reason, uh, main reason for me to quote this book is that the stuff there is in chapter 14 and 15. Okay, so this book is about a thousand pages long and chapters 14 and 15 are around page 800 and so. And, uh, you know, like with every you know, book of that length, it's quite a chore to get, to get there, let, let alone reading the stuff, okay? I mean, it really is a chore. It's sort of curious because, I mean, that's the theory of the secondary fan that we're talking about here. And then one gets to the secondary fan in a treatment of geometry usually when you're just already completely exhausted by everything that came before. And then it seems incredibly complicated because it needs to be tied with everything that was done before. But... Um, it's really sort of a curious accident. I, mean, I don't know the history of this at all, okay, because as, as most working mathematicians, I don't know any history of maths. But, but, it's a, it is, it, I, but still, let me make a statement that is completely unmotivated. It's just my uh, wish. It's, it's, a, it's an accident of history that toric varieties were discovered from the end of the primary fan, and that uh, the secondary fan was discovered much later. In fact, we know you could have started from the secondary fan and discovered the primary fan much later, and that's the kind of introduction to toric geometry that I would like to start giving today, just the first few steps, okay? So, <clears throat> And let's see how it would work if one were to do it from this end, which it hasn't really been done before. So, um, the represent, yeah, so for me, I, I will think of T as being, you know, a coordinatized towards C star to the R, and uh, uh, then the representation is then c corresponds to a matrix D from ZM to ZR, where here ZM and ZR, I think of them as group characters of 
C star to the N, C star to the R. And so this thing here is dual to a group homomorphism uh, C star to the R to the C star to the M. Okay, there are some assumptions that you may want to put on D. You don't need to put them, and sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Uh, so, for example, you, T acts faithfully. Uh, and that corresponds to say that the rows of D uh, span Uh, saturated sublattice inside ZM dual. Yeah? Yes. So, you know, for, yes, yes. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, the kernel of the dual is torsion free. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a different star. This is a little cross. That's a little star. It's the kernel of the dual that I want to be torsion free, of the dual map. Uh, well, you know, uh, Z uh, is a one-dimensional domain, and so it's not totally like straightforward because there is X to one turning up. So you know, uh, don't, don't worry too much about it. It just says that the action of the group is faithful. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you know. Don't worry too much about that. You do, because... Uh, this one is a... Okay, I'll tell you a moment. R times M. And so we're talking about... Um, uh, R rows, M columns. No, R, R rows and M columns. So the columns are these D1 up to DM. Sorry? Column vectors. Column vectors. I don't think so. I will do some examples with numbers, and so, you know, in the end, uh, this will be completely clarified. But ZR is column vectors. These are the column vectors in, the, in ZR. DI equal D of the um, ith vector. Sometimes I don't choose a basis of this ZR, but I always choose a basis of the ZM. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure we're cool. Or equivalently, um, you could say that um, the HCF of the set of R by R minors of D equals 1. And then um, a further assumption in addition, well, it would be clearly in addition, he moreover acts faithfully on uh, all divisors. So there is a lot of abuse notation. Well, let me just not do it then. Uh, try to uh, on x i equal one. 
Uh, there is a quote of Andre Veil that I thought about for you, Don. He said something like, it is impossible to discuss mathematics without abusing notation, <laughs> at least a little bit. <laughs> but then maybe he disagrees. <laughs> So, and, and you know, that corresponds that, to the fact that then uh, you, the, this assumption here needs to be satisfied uh, for all this matrix D i hat, which is D1 with the ith column removed all the way to the M. Satisfy all D i hat. Satisfy the above. Okay. I will not have the time. Yes? Zero. Thank you. I will not have the time to discuss this, what it means, and why, you know. Um, but essentially, these two assumptions are equivalent to when, the, you know, to ask these two things is equivalent to want to, to have the same class of objects that are the standard the toric varieties. Then, if you don't assume these two, then you're looking at something which is slightly more general than Tarkbar, in the good old sense. And uh, uh, okay, so when these two assumptions are satisfied, we say that D is well formed, or the or the quotient is well formed, or whatever. And there are some algorithms. If something is not well formed, uh, if a matrix is not well formed, you can transform it to the one that is. And uh, what exactly is the difference there when you take the quotient is something that one can discuss, and I will not discuss. <clears throat> OK, so it turns out that the quotient depends on the choice of a tilinearized line bundle. Sorry? Yes. Yes. There are two types of men, the Coke people and the Pepsi people, and the HCF and the GCD, okay? I'm an HCF. So, um, so usually I use this notation here. C is the cone spanned by the column vectors of D. This is a cone in uh, R to the R, okay? And the quotient depends on the choice of an element of C, an integer element of C, uh, that's equivalent to a T linearized line bundle on CM. Um, and then the group of sections, so this is supposed to be the group of sections on the quotient, which we don't even know what it is yet, but still can talk about the group of sections, is then going to be the polynomials Them variables which uh, behave nicely and equivariantly. So for all A in CM, uh, for all lambda in T, uh, F 
of lambda a equal chi of lambda f of a. So chi homogeneous polynomial. And out of this thing, uh, you can form the set of stable points, or rather semi-stable points. Let me just call it U chi. And that's the set of all points A in uh, CM, such that uh, there exists an n larger than 0, and an F in uh, gamma L n chi such that f of a is non zero. Uh, that's the set of semi stable points in CM. And uh, sometimes helpful also to look at the unstable locus z chi equal. Um, Pm minus U. That's a closed subset, Zariski closed, NCM. And these are the unstable points. So Let's do the first example. So we take D to be this matrix. Um, one, one, zero, minus N, zero, zero, one, one. Here, n is a positive, I think of n as being a positive integer. So in other words, I want to take the quotient of C4 mod C star squared, OK? And uh, you know the action of C star squared, it's, it's just sort of, let's remind ourselves uh, what this matrix encodes, it encodes an actual C star squared where A0, A0, A1, A2, A3. So the first C star, that's the first row, that maps to lambda A0, uh, lambda A1, A2 stays there, and then lambda to the minus N, A3. And the second C star, so let me, let me put lambda and mu as coordinates of this star squared. We'll send uh, that to A0, A1, mu A2, mu A3. OK, so that's what that matrix is telling us. We're supposed to take the quotient by that action. OK? So. If you've never done it, it's good to do it as an exercise to try and see how the set of stable points uh, and unstable points depend on the choice of your of your chi. So here you plot the columns of D in uh, Z2, or maybe R2, and it sort of looks like this. Um, so, you know, these are the columns, D0, D1, D2, and D3. And so D0 and D1 are the vector uh, 1, 0, so that's D0 and D1 there. And then D2 is the vector 0, 1, so that's D2. And D3 is the vector minus N1 somewhere here. OK? So the cone spanned by all these vectors is, is this cone here. 
And uh, it turns out the, the picture itself divides itself into two uh, subcones. Let me so C1 here and C2. So that's C2, and that's C1. And you know, for me, C1 and C2 are open cones. Sorry? Yes. Oh, I see. I did, but I did introduce this notation earlier last week. And uh, for me, this hooked notation is the cone spanned by those vectors inside. Huh? Oh, you want a plus? No, 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 but, 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 but if for you, so where, should I put a plus here? Okay, no, no, okay, no, but I'm happy to do that. that that's cool, that's cool. <clears throat> Whereas you would, without the plus, it would be the vector space span. That's good, that's good. That's good, thank you. I wondered for a long time what I should do about this. Now I know. So, um, so, for me, these C1 and C2 are the open cones. And uh, uh, so there are two cases. Well, several, but I mean, let's just at least look at the open cones. If C is in C1, okay? If chi is in C1, then then um, the unstable locus, Z chi, is the union of uh, x naught equal x1 equals 0 and x2 equal x3 equals 0. Yeah, in C4. And uh, the stable locus is. Uh, Therefore, uh, C2 minus the origin times uh, C2 minus the origin. And the quotient, oh yeah, so this is, uh, this I didn't say. The torque variety in question, F, the quotient, then is supposed to be a bona fide, okay, whatever that means, quotient of the stable, say stable locus, by the torus T. And so here, the quotient F, uh, u chi mod the C star squared, um, is covered by four charts. Um, you, uh, maybe I call them, well, why, why not, not two, you, not three, you, one, two, you, one, three, uh, mod, oh, these, these guys, uh, mod T, okay. where uij is the set where xi and, X, and xj are both different from zero. This is, this is the quotient which people call the surface fn, the segre surface fn. It's a nice non-singular surface. Something very interesting happens if your stability condition is in C2. Okay? Then, if you look at that, then uh, the unstable locus, Z, is going to be. Um, Uh, 
x naught equal x1 equal x2 equal 0, union x3 equal 0. And you know the stable locus u chi then is C3 minus the origin star uh, times C minus the origin. Uh, so maybe uh, um, okay, so maybe I want to call this u one and uh, I want to call this u two okay maybe not i don't, I don't necessarily want to to do this comparison. Sorry about this. I'm just sort of trying to describe what I'm trying to. Um, so you see, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, when I take the quotient of u chi mod this c star squared, I can actually uh, view this as just the first c3 minus 0 mod uh, a U, uh, just one C star. And so, um, see, if I mean, if I have A naught, A1, A U chi, then I can use the, the second action here, the action of the second copy of C star, multiply by mu equal a3 to the minus 1, and then, you know, then I can send that to uh, b0, b1, b2 equal um, a0, a1, a2 divided by a3. Okay? Conversely, I can think of this as embedded in here as, uh, you know, B0, B1, B2, 1. Then if I act with the first, uh, with the first copy of C star, then that gets mapped to a lambda B0, lambda B1, B2 stays the same, and then I'm supposed to do lambda to the minus n, which again, by the first action, then I, I can act with mu equal lambda to the n now. Sorry? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, we, we, lambda, lambda B0, thank you. Um, then that's equivalent to lambda B0, lambda b1, lambda to the n, b2, and then 1. So you see, this quotient is then the same as this quotient, where now C star acts with weights uh, 1, 1, n. And so here, f, the, the, the quotient, is none other than p1, 1, 1, n. So if you're in the chamber C1, the quotient is the surface fn. And if you're in the chamber C2, the surface p1, 1, n. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did say for me n was a positive integer, though. No. No. 
Yes. Yeah. So, so you don't need to assume anything in complete generality, though I usually assume that C is a strict cone, a sort of, um, yeah? So usually you want C to be a strict cone. In other words, it contains no straight line. So I told you uh, about what happens when chi is in the open chamber C1 and C2. Uh, there are some boundary cases, the, uh, these three lower dimensional cones, and uh, you know, uh, there are various discussions to be had there, and let's just ignore, ignore that, okay? So anyway, that's just an example. If I were to develop the theory of toric varieties from this definition as a quotient, then the proper treatment will have to start from a discussion of stability conditions and the discussion of different quotients that you can take if you vary the stability condition. And that would start by, uh, by doing this bit of theory here. So wall and chamber decomposition. of the cone C. Okay, so this wall and chamber decomposition is the thing that people call the secondary fan. And so the walls are uh, the cones, those cones, D I one D I K uh, that have co dimension one. In uh, R to the R. So in fact here, therefore we could take K to be equal to R minus one. In this example, the walls are going to be just these three lines here. O dimension one codes generated by your vectors. And the chambers are the connected components of the complement of the walls. in C, in the cone C. Uh, because the co-dimension one cones will be generated by R minus one vectors. It's possible, but then that, uh, yeah, 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 but they would be the same, so you know, anyway, it doesn't, it, sometimes try to be too clear when it's confusing. Yeah, indeed, absolutely. And then I'd have to prove a number of things, just you know, from scratch, right there at the beginning. I'd have to say that uh, I can make an ideal, i, chi, and that's the ideal generated by monomials, x, i, 1, x, i, r, oh yeah. I have to choose a chamber, see? And a chi in that chamber? 
And then I would associate the ideal generated by monomials like that, where chi is in the cone spanned by the corresponding vectors. This is an ideal in the ring of polynomials. I'd have to define z chi with a variety of this ideal. It's just a union of coordinate sets. And uh, then I would take the quotient. I would have to show that there is a reasonable bona fide quotient of Cn minus z chi mod t. I'd have to prove that these three objects only depend on the chamber and not on the choice of chi in it. I would want to argue that F chi is an orbifold. Okay, and that it is an orbifold and it's covered by affine charts. And these affine charts are uh, parameterized by simplices that contain the chamber. Yeah, and for each one of those simplices, I have a corresponding open chart, U, I1, IR, mod T, where that, that chart, U, I1, IR, is precise to the chart where the corresponding coordinates, X, I1, is non-zero, X, IR, is non-zero. Okay? And um, I'd be insisting that though I'm dividing that by an R-dimensional torus, which is a connected Lie group, nonetheless, that thing is an orbifold. And so I'd be saying that that chart, U I1 IR mod T, is in fact uh, V I1 IR mod mu, where V is the set where all the corresponding coordinates, I1 up to IR, are equal to 1. And mu is a finite subgroup of the torus. And that in fact, F chi is projective if uh, C is strict. Then F is projective. And um, the chamber C is canonically identified with the ample cone of F. Yeah, so if I were to give a proper treatment you know, of toric varieties from this point of view, I'd have to prove all these things right there at the beginning. From, you know, from scratch. Whereas if you read the book, Cox, Little, and Schenck, they prove those things by using everything that they've done in the 14 preceding chapters. So, you know, this is meant to illustrate that this is just, uh, you know, some, one of these things is basically like a glorified projective space, yeah? Uh, you know, projective space Cn plus 1, 
minus zero. Zero is this thing here. Well, there is only one separate condition in that case. Modulo C star. It's covered by open charts parameterized by this xi. It's xi difference from zero modulo C star. And that's the same as xi equal one modulo nothing. In that case, this mu is nothing. Okay. And that as you're used to working to project a space by taking local charts and looking what happens, you can do it on one of these things. It's just a bit more laborious, but not in, in principle any different. So I want to give another example uh, where I show you these charts, some genuine or before the example now. Uh, but I want to conflate that together with an example of a complete intersection, a toric variety. So let me then tell you, uh, go just a bit further than this and tell you a bit more about uh, complete intersections in toric variety. So, you know, fix a toric variety, uh, namely an action together with stability condition now. And now let's talk a little bit about complete intersections. So here, I choose in addition a few more characters, chi1 up to chi c in uh, um, uh, zr. And then uh, you take functions fi in uh, gamma chi i, and then the complete intersection is going to be uh, the variety of those functions, f1 equals c equals 0. That's a subset of cm. So I am supposed to also remove the unstable locus, z chi, and then I divide all this thing by t, and that's a subset of f. And that's what the complete intersection is. And so there are some definitions. Let me um, I'm just put, put them here, even though I won't have a huge amount of time to. I'm going to say that x is quasi smooth, quasi smooth. If either the variety of these guys is all contained in Z, or in fact, is th if this variety minus Z chi is smooth, and you know this this lives in C M minus Z chi of the expected co-dimension, of co-dimension. C. <clears throat> and then, in addition, I'm going to say that x is well-formed. If uh, for every stratum S in F, stratum with non-trivial stabilizer, uh, if, if that stratum is contained in X, then it's co dimension in X is at least two. Okay, sorry. About this part of this exercise is to at least give this definition. Yeah, yeah, of course. 
And uh, we had these two conditions at the... Um, you know, maybe I shouldn't... Um, let, let, let me not even try to say that. It's, you definitely, most of the time, want to work with well-formed complete intersections because otherwise certain things will go wrong. So I'm going to now um, discuss the first problem a problem in the example sheet, and um, I'll sort of set it up. And um, uh, so here's an example. So consider this data for a, a toric complete intersection. So first I write the matrix of the action. Okay, so this is my matrix D. Uh, so, you know, D1, D2, all the way to D6. And then I put a vertical bar, and next to it I, I put two characters, two, two characters, two, four, zero, one. Okay, so these are the two line bundles, okay, chi one and chi two. And so uh, the tasks are, what's the, the, ex the exercise consists in uh, fix stability condition to ensure that X is a final object. So by the way, so this is C6 mod C star squared, so it's a toric fourfold, and inside, you know, I have two line bundles, so this is supposed to be a surface. Uh, then um, find all singularities of X. And make sure that X is a well-formed orbifold. And uh, maybe compute KX squared. the degree of the canonical class, okay? So let's try and do all these things. So, you know, you plot your vectors, D1 up to uh, D6. So D1 is here. Uh, D2 is the vector 1, 1, so that's right there. Uh, D3 is the vector 1, 2, that's up here. D4 and D5s are the vectors 0, 1. And D6 is up here. So you see there are uh, 1, 2, and 3 chambers. Those are the... Uh, those are the... Um, the walls, and there are three chambers. So um, the anti-canonical class of X, so let's, go, let's get down to the first task. Uh, a task. I want to fix the stability condition such that X is final. I want to choose one, one, of, my, one, of, one of these chambers. Uh, the anti-canonical class of X is, uh, you know, minus KF minus L1 minus L2 restricted to X, 
and minus kf is the sum of all those d's. So 3 minus 2, that's 1. And then here I have uh, 5 plus 3 is 8, minus 5, that's 3. OK? So the vector 1, 3 is somewhere here. And so if I want, remember that the chamber then is going to be your ample cone. And so if you want that to be ample, you better choose this chamber here as your stability condition. OK, so that's your chamber, C equal amp F. <clears throat> so that's task one. So this, this thing has charts. Uh, Uij mod t uh, where i is in the set 1, 2, 3 and j is in the set 4, 5, 6. So we have nine charts. And in this game um, you really have to check them all. Sort of, uh, let me demonstrate. So some of them are not as interested in some other charts. So I want to look at the chart now. Let me look at U16. Okay? So mod T. So U16 means... Uh, x1 different from 0, x6 different from 0, okay? So you just sort of look at this action here. Uh, and uh, um, in order to see this, so you put both of those non-zero, and then you see I can use the first group action to set the first coordinate to 1. And then I can use the second group action to set up the sixth coordinate to 1. But there will be an ambiguity there of a mu 3. Uh, I have to take this cube root, and there is no unique way to do that. So in fact, uh, this is the same as uh, x1 equal x6 equals 1 modulo a mu 3. OK? So in fact, um, this chart is the thing that I tend to, I, I write like this. I write a third. So I put x1 equal x6 equal 1. So on this chart, I have coordinates x2, x3, x4, x5. And then how does that mu3 act? Well, you see, that action does preserve the fact that this guy equal 1. And so essentially, that mu3 acts Think a moment about this with weights 1, 2, 1, 1. So here I write 1, 2, 1, 1. So my notation for these things is that I write 1 over R, A1, AN, to mean the quotient of CN by mu R, where mu R, the group of Rth roots of unity, acts with weights a1 up to a n. So you see, this, in this chart, the Yortoric variety is a genuine orbifold. It's not a smooth thing. And you have to look at nine other charts. And I don't have the time to look at many of these charts. But let me just say, this is uh, what happens in this particular chart. <clears throat> So I want to study a little bit the complete intersection now. So uh, x1 equal 
F1, uh, so F1, remember, that's the section in, of uh, the first line bundle, chi 1, L1. And uh, F1 contains, let me write some monomials that F1 contains, that, that F1 can use. Uh, so in, in chi 1, I have to be in 2, 4. So... Uh, for example, x1 to the fourth times x4 squared. That's in the correct weight, weight space, yeah? This guy to the fourth is in 4, 0, and x4 squared is in 0, 2, so together in 2, 4. Let me make a list of some monomials that F1 can use, so not contains, can use may use the following monomials, may use x1, x, x4, uh, x1 squared, x, uh, sorry, x1 squared, x4 to the fourth, x1 squared, x1, x5 to the fourth, uh, x1 squared, x4, x6, and so on. Uh, incidentally, uh, chi1 is the vector 2, 4. Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So this line bundle is on the boundary of the cone. It's right here. That's where L1 is. It's an F, it's an F bundle, okay? But notice here that, um, okay, so the first thing to note is that no pure monomial I'm sorry, I'm going to have to overrun for about five minutes. Hopefully that's all right. Yeah? There is no pure mon so here, um, yeah, perhaps I should have said, I want to study x intersection u16, okay? I study the complete intersection x in this open set here, v16 mod mu3. So what happens in this open set? So I do not have any pure monomial. F cannot, may not use any pure monomial in x1 and x6. And you see, to be, to be in this chart, you have to put x1 equal x6 equal 1. So what that means is that somehow when I look at this chart, there is no constant term. And so the center point of this chart, uh, the origin of this chart, let me call it little x16, must lie in the variety of f1. There is just no way out. So even though it's an f line bundle, it has this base point in its base locus. And so, you know, Bertini, non Bertini, we have to verify that the thing is quasi-smooth and well-formed. And so, but fortunately, we can use may use a monomial of the form x1 to the a, x6 to the b, times a linear term, xj, some other j. For example, um, x1 squared, x4, x6. And this implies that the thing is, um, well, at least the variety of f1, is uh, quasi-smooth. You know, it's f1 equals 0, uh, constant term 0, but the Taylor expansion contains a linear term, so it's a non-zero gradient. And so, you know, by some version of uh, inverse function theorem, this thing is, uh, is quasi-smooth. 
Here I'm looking at the complete intersection, though, of F1 and F2. And so we have to make a similar analysis for the, the other uh, the other line bundle, the line bundle L2. And, you know, that's, that's pretty strict, the requirement there. F2, these are just, have just two sections. So this may only use two monomials. Uh, may only use... the monomials x4 and x5, but that's okay. And so we have a similar analysis to this. And so when you, when you push this to the end, then the, the center of that particular chart, the point x16, has to lie on the complete intersection X. Uh, but you see, F1 uh, can have a linear term X4, and F2 can have linear term X5. And so using the inverse function theorem, analytically, locally at that point, I can solve for X4 and X5. And so then uh, x1 equals x6 equals 0. I solve for x4 and x5. I am left with x2 and x3. And so, in fact, x itself is uh, quasi-smooth, well-formed, and has a singularity a third, 1, 2, at that point. So... That just finishes the discussion of this particular chart here, X U16. So you have to study all other eight charts. You really have to do it. And the conclusion is going to be that X has two singular points. One of this form, a third one, two, and the other one is a third one, one. And so at the moment, uh, we do not automatize this task. We, we have to do it more or less by hand, okay? You don't do this by computer. There isn't a difficulty in principle, but this is um, looking at all the charts and making doing this analysis is a lot of work. Uh, okay, how to compute kx squared? Okay, so uh, instead of doing the computation. Let me sort of, uh, okay, so this, you know, once you've done all the nine charts, this will verify that all the singularities, uh, compute all the singularities, and that, that's a well-formed orbital. To compute kx squared, um, let me lay out some principles. The child group of f, of the toric variety f, at least over the rationals. Well, again, you know, you have to take this seriously. Uh, if you want to develop the whole theory of toric geometry from this point of view, then you have to do everything, including homology, homology, child group, and everything, without talking about fans. And so the child group is generated by the divisors, with a bunch of relations. And the relations in questions are just uh, di1, dir equals 0, where um, a, 
I want times, you know, times. These are C dots. D, D I R equals zero when your chamber is contained in the cone D I one D I R plus. Okay, that's your child group. It still doesn't tell you how to compute degrees. And am I saying this right? Yes, I think I am. And um, uh, but then you you can also write other things. So if C uh, if C is contained in this cone D I one D I R plus okay. No, um, but um, yeah, but these guys are in. Uh, you have to think them as living in. Yeah, you're right. So in other words, um, they are in um, that R. <laughs> I'm already running, so you know. Let, let, let me say this one is a bit more important. So. Um, the degree of the product of the dj, j different from ik, is uh, 1 over mu. Okay, where mu is that finite group such that, you know, this already corresponds to some chart, V uh, I1 I R mod mu, and mu is the order of that group there. And that's because those divisors will only meet in this chart, at the center of it, and uh, then that's going to be the, the degree of that intersection. And so, if, so this don't not only turns the child group, but also the degree function. And you know, if you use this, um, you you have to practice a bit. But uh, and I, you know, maybe the, in, in the problem class will tell you how to do it if you're interested. If you're not, then. Uh, uh, so you compute that kx squared equals 10 over 3 for this surface. It's a perfectly beautiful, good, nice orbifold. Move well formed. And it has that degree. So you know, maybe next time, I don't know who, whether I or I'll do next time, but I will also tell you how to connect uh, this treatment of toric varieties with the standard treatment. Sorry for uh, keeping you so long.